welcome, welcome, greetings all. This is the first episode of what I'm going to call Popcorn Mondays, which will very rarely be uploaded on Mondays, but I kind of like the name. I am a published novelist with a PhD in English literature, and for this channel I chose the hilarious name of Dr. Gentleman, which I have absolutely no regrets about choosing. Honest. Generally, I make videos about classic writing from the likes of Shakespeare and Keats. Uh, oddly enough, that hasn't seemed to really capture the imagination of the youths out there in the verdant fields of YouTube, but I enjoy movies about space wizards just as much as long novels about the extramarital affairs of 19th century Russian aristocracy. And you know what? When I saw Star Wars last night, I just wanted to lay out my thoughts somewhere. Where better than here? As someone whose life revolves around storytelling, I like to think I have at least a, a little bit of academic clout behind what I say. You know, a teensy modicum, maybe. And look, being an academic doesn't mean I have to talk about the hero's journey. If I ever seriously try and make that old chestnut sound exciting, shoot me. Okay, so the rise of Skywalker. We'll always be with you. No one's ever really gone. <laughs> I didn't hate it, but I didn't love it either. I didn't particularly like it, and if I had to give it a rating, I'd probably give it a... 4 or 4.5 out of 10. But I really think that it was close, very close, to being a decent, entertaining piece of work, and all it would have taken would have been one or two more drafts of the screenplay from someone who really knew what they were doing. And if you haven't seen it yet, and you're afraid of spoilers, avert thine eyes and thine ears from here on in, okay? Okay, now obviously this story does not exist in a vacuum. I think it was the guys from Red Letter Media who said these sequels will in future probably be taught as an example of how not to plan a trilogy. And I think that's got some merit to it. And whatever your opinion on how successful these movies are, the fact is that these three films were not planned out as a cohesive, fulfilling storyline, and instead had two directors not only writing their own scripts, but consciously undermining what had gone before them with each new movie. Plotting out this third film under those circumstances was excruciatingly difficult from the outset. Yet, I do believe that the basic story premise could have worked. Maybe not to great effect, but to a degree I would have considered it cohesive and satisfying overall and it wouldn't have taken a whole lot of additional work. Let's recap how we got here, just briefly. Um, the first three Star Wars films are, and always will be, cultural monoliths that define an era, and have influenced just about everything that came after them in popular culture. George Lucas took the tropes of Japanese Jidai Geki, samurai movies, especially from Kurosawa Akira, and simply transplanted them into space. It's probably worth mentioning, especially with The Mandalorian currently enjoying such success, that these samurai flicks were in turn heavily influenced by old cowboy movies. Um, Lucas's script was eventually polished enough not to be a straight rip-off of The Hidden Fortress. Uh, a lot of the excessive bloat of his opening scenes were brilliantly edited out. And some great bold characterization, clever story contrivances, world-building and pioneering special effects made Star Wars a smash hit. The Empire Strikes Back did much the same but with more polish and confidence and The Last Jedi stumbled a little bit but rounded the trilogy off well. The prequels are widely considered a failure, or failures, though at the time they were visual marvels but suffered from a director who kind of forgot that he did his best work when, I don't want to say ripping off, um, sticking closely to the established story beats of genre cinema, and innovating in other ways. I'm not going to talk about spin-off movies, or holiday specials, or Ewok adventures, just the core films. Next came the modern Disney trilogy. The Force Awakens came out and scratched an itch for a generation that adores nostalgia. But 
left most of us largely thinking it was okay, I enjoyed it, but it was just a new hope again with slight variations, so if what it sets up is superlative work, this would have been a good start. J.J. Abrams had done well with Star Trek, so why not Star Wars as well? Although, of course, Abrams made his name with Lost, where I, at the very least, mostly remember the feeling of this guy has no idea how to finish the stories he writes. Ryan Johnson set out to subvert what had come before him. He wanted to make a Star Wars unlike what anyone was expecting. No more pompous, esoteric noble orders, no more slick Riefenstahl aesthetics that even if we're looking at the bad guys, it might come over as a wee bit too fascistic, you know? Instead, how about we make the New Order clownish and ineffectual, and make the Jedi and their authoritarianism mostly pretty sinister? Why not make our old hero a weird old coot, regretting past ignoble deeds, and make the Force available not solely to old privileged institutions, but potentially to everyone, so that the disenfranchised can be empowered. And I get it. I get the idealism behind these decisions and the desire to upend this institution, but this was emphatically the wrong time to do it. A side story in the vein of Rogue One or Solo would have been the place for that kind of subversion, not the main series of films, especially when the only way the first movie was going to be remembered as satisfying was for the second to pay off the build-up. You can't have a first movie be purely preparation for future payoffs, then subvert expectations by having zero payoff. And if you do want to go down that road, it needs to be part of a strong, compelling narrative, not two ships following each other very slowly through space with ultimately very few consequences. Okay, this isn't a Last Jedi review. But I should probably say I didn't enjoy that film very much in storytelling terms. And uh, yeah, very little happened in the movie. And that's where we were left for the big finale. The last opportunity to tie everything together and give a sense of satisfaction to a hugely polarised audience. Star Wars had become divisive instead of universally adored, politicised where once it was escapist. And um, the fruit the first film had dangled, the second had gleefully stomped upon. And that's decidedly not an easy starting point for a screenwriter. But lest we forget, the other great popcorn movie franchise of our time recently hung its big finale on time travel, a cast of several dozen named characters flying around battling CG blobs, and rapid lurches between serious dialogue and comedy. And I'd say they made it work. I firmly believe people would have been receptive to the decisions made for the Rise of Skywalker's story as a whole if the film had been more enjoyable and emotionally resonant. So our plot outline for this movie is that Palpatine is back, and somehow has made a huge fleet that will destroy the universe. Fine. It will do. Rey has been training hard and has to go and stop this new threat. She finds the various MacGuffins that get her there with some minor help from her friends, and a lot of help from absurd coincidence while also fending off attacks from Kylo Ren. In the end, she battles Palpatine while her friends have to take care of the fleet, uh, which is also an echo of Return of the Jedi, where pretty much the same setup happens with Luke. I'm not going to pick holes in the plot, though there are many. That stuff has been covered extensively on YouTube already. Red Letter Media are good at it, Mauler will probably rip it to shreds in a 10 hour video, there'll be an everything wrong with, and I think the Screen Rant pitch meetings are works of absolute genius when it comes to pointing out movie flaws, but also making you laugh. Yes, okay, it's dumb that the heroes happen to be in the right place to find the dagger, yes, it's dumb that Palpatine reappeared with zero foreshadowing, yes, random new force powers appear, and the way Palpatine is overcome is pretty unsatisfying. But we're happy to let stuff of that level slide in a lot of movies that are still mostly adored, 
And yes, I think that could have been the case here. But there's a much, much bigger problem from my point of view as someone who thinks a lot about stories. And that's that they made the characters here extremely difficult for the audience to care about. What I can do is say what I think would have made this movie work. Other than, of course, going back in time to plan it thoroughly from the start. And I think there was actually a move towards this idea in the film. It was probably suggested in story discussions and everyone said, yeah, let's do that. But then it never got fully implemented. I think what would have saved The Rise of Skywalker would have been to make the characters actually bond with each other and work together as a team. I definitely detected some attempt to move in this direction just before the final act, but it never gets developed. And it feels like they incorporated the uncomfortable setup for it without the resolution and catharsis that it could lead to. Basically, it's my considered opinion that the key reason this film did not work is that there was no camaraderie whatsoever between the cast members. We were never led to feel they liked being together. They bonded together, or that they would sacrifice anything for one another. We mostly get the feeling that this is a crew of individuals who mostly dislike each other. We basically open with Ray and Poe squabbling. You're difficult. The main characters constantly dig at each other. You are a spice runner, you are a stormtrooper. C-3PO becomes a total verbal punching bag, who our heroes seem to utterly detest. There's a moment where he's meant to be sacrificing himself. And sure, it gets undone not long after, but when the main characters believe C-3PO has essentially just died, they have absolutely no concern for him and continue to make their passive-aggressive jokes. It's like kicking a dog because its yapping is a bit annoying. It's just not likeable. Later they find out Hux is the spy and saved their lives, and they obviously have to know, even if, if they try to fake a wound, he's just going to be killed for letting them escape. But they don't think twice about leaving him behind to die so they can live. I wonder if cinema will ever see a more pathetic character arc than that of General Hux. There's also a little moment of urgency when the heroes think that Chewie is dead, and sure, it's undone very quickly, but there's little sense that they're mourning what's happened, or contemplating the real ramifications. Just one very basic scene suggesting Rey has a superficial and kind of self-centred guilt over what happened. It's so easy to draw more emotion out of a moment like that, even if you hit Control z a few scenes later. Probably the most realistic chemistry in the whole film is between Poe and his old flame. But once she's handed over her magic token, Poe couldn't care less about her. Absolutely the central problem here is that the characters seem to have no regard for anyone else's feelings or desires or hopes and dreams. And that's why it falls apart and the audience doesn't care. They show no sign of caring about one another, so why should we care about them? I honestly think tweaking this one issue would have saved this movie. They could have looked to Marvel, Guardians of the Galaxy, uh, even the generalised group of Avengers might bicker and have banter with each other, but they clearly show that the characters give a crap if one of their teammates gets hurt or is suffering. We need more of that One Piece fixation on Nakama, on crewmates or comrades. The Rise of Skywalker is too wrapped up in pinballing its characters from place to place to let them have any emotional development. And what I strongly feel would have anchored the whole thing would have been having the core of this movie be the transition from not gelling and finding each other kind of annoying to working as a tight, united team. This would have given the actors the chance to show their chops as they came to understand each other. We could have seen them grow and for things to affect them emotionally beyond the next two lines whereupon any emotional strand is quickly snipped away. Having approximately the same depth of feeling as a potato is what sunk this movie for me. I didn't actually dislike any of the characters. Rey was a little annoying in The Last Jedi, but we saw her working hard here, and the question of whether she'd been drawn to the dark side was interesting. Uh, she got to have scenes with Kylo Ren, who at least gets to be angsty, although him just completely changing his ways at one echoed whisper from his mother could have been expanded on 
quite a bit, I feel. I like Finn, and I like Poe as individuals. I like Chewie and 3PO, although I do feel like the writers of this script didn't really get that 3PO is best when he pops up to say something very blunt or overly obvious to break tension, and then fades into the background again. Having him just giving a constant barrage of mildly annoying dialogue did him no favours here. One more draft, I think that's all it would have taken. Keep the outline, keep the daft Mumra's pyramid ending, it was adequate, if we were by then totally on the hero's side. But to get there, we need to stress something like Rey realising she can be supported by others and doesn't have to be alone anymore. The second lightsaber could actually have reinforced that point, that someone else is supporting her, but it would have had to have come from an extended overarching plot, where presumably she really connects with and changes Ben, and they realise their connection is more than just a random quirk of the Force. Can you imagine if they had Poe and Rey and maybe Finn as well all have a huge fight over Chewie's death? but later reconcile and realise they need each other, not just to win fights, but because they can rely on one another for support. Maybe develop the idea that the guys resent Rey hauling herself up in training, rather than being there to fight beside them, and then have her explain why it was important she did that. You know, like an actual human being who wants to set others at ease around her. Finn keeping a secret from Rey also could have fed into that, uh, learning to trust her and then her realising that trust is important. You know, one thing that my agent hammers home to me when writing my books is that characters should have their own individual arcs, and it just doesn't feel like that happened here. How different was Rey from when the movie started? I guess she learned a bit more about whether the dark side was in her, but what did she learn about how to deal with people, or what the possibility of harming a loved one really means? Did Poe learn anything in this movie? Did Finn? Did they learn anything over the entire course of the trilogy? And was any of it on a level that we as the viewers could find in some way touching? It's fine to focus on the ropey coincidental plot, or your feeling that Rey didn't earn her powers, or the Emperor hiding out in space with a massive armada as the main problems here. But I really do believe that if most viewers cared about Rey, Poe, Finn, Rose, Chewie, Lando and whoever else, because they connected with them, and because they had seen growth and humanity in them, we'd have finished the saga with at least a sense of catharsis and satisfaction. The reason for the feeling of hollowness so many had coming out of the movie was, I believe, that the characters were hollow, devoid of emotional realism or development. It may sound like an abstraction, but it's not hard to overlay these elements on a script, especially one that had so many side stories that could have been pared down to make room for some deeply necessary human connection. And the Marvel movies managed to do this. I can't speak for everyone in the world, but I would be willing to bet that substantially more people care what happens to Rocket Raccoon than to Rey. And that should tell you something about your writing. Rogue One managed to get me to care about characters I've completely forgotten the names of, but remember on an emotional level. And Pixar are the goddamn masters of it. Get your script doctored by someone from one of these teams, within Disney. Find someone who can examine the story on an emotional level. Trust me, it would have been worth it. Not that it matters now, I suppose. Next time, maybe. And, well, that's about all I have to say on the subject, so I extend the same sentiments to you, dear reader. Next time, maybe. Until then.